So Ray has a very interesting program for us tonight. It's a little different than what we typically do. Usually it's a slideshow with all kinds of highfalutin stuff. But this time I think he's going to ramble for a while about what he encountered during his career. And then we're going to do some hands-on spectroscopy. So he's going to show us some of the spectra of different light sources and stuff like that to try to explain how them they us. work. Yeah, yeah. We visited him last summer a couple on a couple trips with our volunteers. We went to his little observatory up in Laramie, Wyoming, and we we're all amazed at what he had done up there. Hopefully, you'll have some pictures I do. of that observatory in your slideshow. I do. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ray Martin. Okay. <laughs> It's on. Excellent. Okay. Oh, oh hello. Anyway, okay. Uh, I, what I'm going to try and do here tonight is a couple of different things. First of all, I would, as uh, as Mainta said, we can start. I can give you some idea of how I got here. Okay. I mean, there are some very interesting places, things, events that brought me to this place now, 71 years later. Um, so it's something that I'd like to, uh, I, could, I can explain with a few pictures, and then at some point in time we'll start talking a little bit about spectroscopy, because one of the things that Mainta asked me to talk about was spectra and how we, why we can do things in the backyard. Okay. We don't need all kinds of expensive instrumentation, etc. We can build these things on our own, and we can do science with the things that we've built. So what I'm going to do, and please be with, bear with me, because in some cases uh, I'm not as much of a gadgeteer as some other people are, and sometimes these things work for me, and sometimes they don't. <laughs> so let's, um, I'm going to try the first button. If it doesn't work, I'm in a lot of trouble. Well, you have to point it over there. Uh, where? That's okay. Oh. No, you don't have to point it there. Right? You don't have to. Okay, John. Okay, see? Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. How many of you have been to this place? Ah, good for you, really. The Griffith Observatory, yes. This was home away from home for me. Okay. This is a place I, I had to coerce, do everything I could to get my dad to drive me up there when I was too young to drive myself. But once I got there, it was just fantastic. Some of the things I got to do, places. They had some displays that were just amazing. The uh, dome here on the right is a triple coelostat, which gives you three different mirrors for three different telescope systems. So he was at, they were able to take that system, point one down so you could see the solar spectra, point one down so you could see the sun in H alpha light, and then they had one that was just a white light image of the sun about three feet in diameter that you could look at on a screen, and it was really fun to do. And then the other one on the left there, oh, I've got a picture of him, that's a 12 inches ice refractor. Yeah, that's what I said. So anyway, uh, the big dome in the background is the planetarium. And then the kind of a greenish dome there in front, because it's, it's, it's got its little, um, what do you call that? Uh, uh, the, uh, what? It? Yeah, but the, the color is um, green. <laughs> yeah, it's green. But it's, it's what happens to bronze or brass when it, when it goes to hell. The patina, that's the word I was looking for. Okay, and that has a Foucault pendulum that swings back and forth. So when you go inside, the first thing you see when you walk in the door is the Foucault pendulum. And then you can sit there and watch it, and it actually shows you how the Earth can be rotating because every once in a while they have these little wooden dowels set up around the perimeter, and then you can go out while you're standing there, it's missing them, and then all of a sudden it knocks one over. And the only way that could have happened is if it rotated under the pendulum, which is kind of cool. So you can actually see what's going on. So let's try this again. Ah, wonderful. Now it really is working. That's the dome of the Zeiss. And it, it's the, I show you, you saw. And you can see Los Angeles out here in the background. And if any of you have seen some of the movies they've shot here, like, a, oh, God, let me think. The Rocketeer, um, um, Rebel Without a Cause, uh, The Hellstrom Chronicles. They shot all these movies at the Griffith Observatory. And of course, Ed Krupp, who was my old astronomy teacher, who is now the director of the observatory, he just rubs his hands together because Hollywood loves to give, throw money at him while they put, they put things on the roof. Of course, um, some, of, some of you may or may not remember Arnold Schwarzenegger walking uh, to the end of this uh, wall in Terminator, looking over Los Angeles that one evening. So, but what this had, when I went downstairs, was a display of spectra. And I don't know about you guys. Am I hitting this with myself? It was, okay. Down, down, okay, right there. There, okay. Um, 
I've always thought spectra was magic. When you see things, like if you've got some crystalline things hanging in a window or something, and the sun passes through them, and you look down and you see this beautiful little colored spectra. Have you ever thought about looking at that saying, how can that be? I mean, the sun is white. And every little glass gadget can break it up into this magic, beautiful series of colors. And it's like, wow, that's, that's just something. I got to know more about that, right? Because I couldn't believe. And you could, you know, so you get a little prism then, something even a little better, and a white piece of paper. And you go out in your summer afternoon and pass the sun right through there. And boy, there it is. And we're going to see some of that a little later on today. So when I saw that, I said, okay. And this is what I saw. Um, this is a textbook, but it is essentially what I saw. So here we have three series of spectra. This is solar spectrum. And when you, the very top is what the solar continuous spectrum looks like, where you see no absorption features at all. Now, if you come down to the solar spectrum with its absorption lines, there it is. You can see that okay, right? Oh, hello. That's not what I wanted to do. There we go. Okay, so, so we have absorption features, and what he said in this particular thing is how his, the students would see it, and why is his student look better than his own? Well, because when we get older, we start losing this part of our visual spectrum. So as you, get, as you progress in age, we begin to lose that particular sensitivity. So he saw it without this, and this is basically the way I see it too. But the students being young and their eyes being as what they are, they can actually see more into the violet part of the spectrum. This line, this pair of lines right here is part of magnesium. Right here would be the sodium doublet. There's not enough resolution to show that this is actually two lines. And then this guy out here is the hottest one. That is your hydrogen line, hydrogen alpha, which is essentially the most prodigious uh, element in the universe. And it is, takes a very, very large place in, uh, in the uh, solar spectrum. Now, here are some, here is the entire hydrogen line. How many here has taken a physics course? Okay, so you know about the Balmer series of hydrogen. Okay, well, that's what we're seeing right here. This is H alpha. Hello? Question? Okay. This is H alpha, and then you have beta, gamma, and delta. But you'll notice they're in a very magic sequence. And if you do the mathematics, you'll be able to actually calculate why this sequence exists. And uh, I'm not going to get into that today because we'd be here till tomorrow afternoon. So, but helium, as you can see, has a completely different signature. And you think, well, that's interesting. How does all that work? Now, these lines are formed by, they are emission lines, okay, that show what particular chemicals exist, what particular part of the signature exists in these particular uh, spectra. And if you go further, mercury, there's a nice big bright sodium doublet right here. And there are a lot of other lines here. Some of them are because of the particular chemical. Some of them are just there uh, as a background because of the other, other gases, other particular things that could exist in the discharge tubes. And then finally, we have neon, which has a great deal of lines down here in the red and quite a few over here. But again, these become incredibly difficult to see, especially as somebody my age, but somebody here younger might be able to do that. I have a neon discharge tube on the table and we'll be able to look at neon in real time rather than these pictures. Now, one thing I have discussed on and on, I have a friend at the university. There, okay. Now. The one thing I really love and detest are pictures. When I, I built a spectroscope, which I will show you. I have a friend at the university. He's, his name's Dr. Michael Pierce. He's an associate professor. He's an astrophysicist. And we were talking one day about looking at spectra and what kind of we could do for the students. So I brought my spectroscope that I built, and I put it in the back of a, one of the telescopes at, on campus. And we looked at the sun, and he was blown away. He just thought, Oh, my students have to see this. And I said, yeah, let's see what we can do. So we brought the classes up, and they looked. And we tried to show them that you know, they can get a book. And they look in this book, and they see, well, what am I going to see here? There, come on. 
there, here it comes. Okay, it's gonna be, oh, there, yeah. <laughs> there. You can see the spectra. It's not very pretty. We got all the lines and everything, but it's two dimensional and it's not very interesting, right? And so if you put up a, a picture like this and they would look at it and they think, well, it's all smoke and mirrors. Well, it does have one mirror in it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but under the circumstances, to see it in real time is the real cool thing. To actually see the solar spectrum, this bad boy right here, with those, emission, those uh, absorption lines is really quite wonderful. Some of the things that happened in the past to put this together was Kirchhoff and Bunsen, when they were doing some experiments, they actually took sodium, heated it, so it would, it would outgas, and they saw these two very, very bright sodium lines. Again, like I told you, this one is not enough resolution to show you how that doublet, but it is. Then they passed a solar light of the sun through the same spectrograph and found that there were two very dark lines that match these two, I mean, two bright lines that match these two dark lines exactly. Sodium exists on the sun. What an incredible discovery, okay? So it's, now we can do that. You can build something in your backyard that'll do exactly the same thing, but show it to you in real time. Show it to you without having to use pictures. And that's the part I like the most. So we'll move a little further. So we're going to get just slightly past the spectra now. And we're, uh, who was the one who took a, sucked in a breath when I said a 12 inches ice refractor? <laughs> that's the one that's on the roof. There's only one. They made a 10 inch, which is at the uh, Franklin Museum on the roof of their building. This is a wonderful, marvelous instrument. You walk into it, you just see it. It's just an unbelievably beautiful thing. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but I do have a fun story about this. You'll notice, use this again. Oh, no, that's not what I want. There we go. There's a folks here right here. Now, the guy who runs this, right, he sets it all up, as I'm sure Mainta does, when you look through the 24 inch or the 16. And he sets it up with a ladder, you can see it right there. And he lets everybody come up and look through the telescope. Well, he thinks, seems to think that everybody focuses at the same place. But we don't. Sometimes not even close. So I had a friend of mine and I, my very good friend Larry Barstow, we went to there and saw it. He had it on Saturn or something. So I walked up there, looked at it. It was out of focus, blurry. So I. I did the terrible thing. I touched his telescope. <laughs> and I, I thought the man was going to internally hemorrhage. He said, what are you doing? You can't touch that telescope. I said, look, it's out of focus, pal. And if I want to see, this, I want to see Saturn, I don't want to just see a big blurry blob. So he got all upset and told me that I have to get off the ladder and don't, don't do that again and on and on. So of course, when I went down, Larry, my friend who was right behind me, walked up and focused the telescope. <laughs> He was, I thought, I thought for sure we'd have to dial 911. This guy was really upset. But the image was fantastic. Anyway, okay, so that's the Zeiss. Now here, we move along a little further. This is a telescope that I built and took to the Riverside Telescope Makers Convention. And uh, this was a fun telescope. Um, I don't know how many here who know, who know who Richard Berry is? No one, okay, oh, one person in the back. He used to be the publisher of Astronomy Magazine, the editor, and he had his own magazine for a while called Telescope Making. So he built one like this, and so I built one that I thought was better, and it was. And I took it to Riverside, and Richard Berry walked up and saw that, and he said, it's better than the one I built. So they have a contest, and all the judges came around sniffing, looking, touching, feeling, and they said, this is really a wonderful telescope, but unfortunately, Richard Berry did it first, so we can't give you the award. <laughs> so I was happy that, as you can see, I'm a very happy person, and I, uh, I was happy to know that Richard Berry thought it was better than his. But anyway, this is what I used to do in my store, and I do a couple of other things. So the next place I found a home in was a place in Los Angeles called the Stoney Ridge Observatory. 
This was a wonderful place. It's very much like what you're sitting in because it was donations and people who could build things. And they all, they all donated their time, volunteered, etc. And they built this wonderful observatory just behind Mount Wilson up on the Angeles Crest Highway. But you'll notice it's lovely color. It's all nicely kind of a beigey bottom and the top is typically white. When they first built this, the Forest Service up in the Angeles National Forest, all of their trash cans were pink and green. Pink bottom, green top. Everything the Forest Service used was pink and green. They told them, you want to put that up? Pink and green. <laughs> so the first time I saw this building, pink and green. And it was like, oh my God, how can you do that? So they finally convinced the Forest Service at some point in time that they're not, we gotta do something about the pink and green. Anyway, here's the place, lovely. You can see the mountains in the background. This back here is their warm room. <sighs> Had KFC in there a lot. It was really nice. <laughs> it was, but it was, this was a beautiful old telescope. Huh? Did they deliver? Uh, actually, somebody went down to get it. Some minion, you know. But it was, it was really kind of fun, and it was, right, it was a great thing. Now, the reason I, this, the last two pictures are to show, I'm sure you all heard of that fire, the station fire up around Mount Wilson, almost burned Mount Wilson down. It almost burned Stony Ridge down as well. You can see they had to cut down a tree, and you can see all the trees around them are dead. And here's the best one. You can see the whole place was burned down, except where they cleared the, the dirt, the, everything away from the observatory, and they saved it. So it was kind of neat. But this was a wonderful place. First time I saw M30, M51 in a 30-inch aperture telescope, it was something to behold. And the way, yes? Oh, okay, but they had a, I have a picture. There's a 30-inch telescope. Much like the one Minta has, it's a Newtonian with a broken Cassegrain. But they used it as a Newtonian. So there was this, you can just keep, get a little bit of it right over in here, but they had a lift, like a cherry picker, that would take you to the eyepiece, which was right up here. So when you were sitting on that, standing in that cherry picker, you were quite a ways off the ground and standing in the open shutter. But it was so beautiful because you had this great sky vaulting above you. You had the, the sense of the forest and everything blowing in. And then you had these absolutely pitch black skies and 30 inches of aperture and a spiral galaxy. And it, you just didn't get any better than that, so it was fantastic. So we really loved this place. And this was built by a man named Al uh, uh, Carroll and Cram, who built both of these, this telescope, completely home built. And it was a wonderful instrument. Yes? So before and after the forest burned, yes. was the atmosphere any better or worse? Um, I really couldn't say that without with any kind of uh, knowledgeability because I just don't know. I wasn't there before and after, and I wasn't able to contact anyone there at the time. But I would guess, while it still smoldered, it was probably pretty bad. <laughs> so, once I left Stony Ridge, I went to Rockwell International, and I worked on both the Saturn V second stage and the Apollo command module. Now, you might look at this and say, well, okay, I've seen those before, what's up with that? Uh, the fact is that this is Endeavor, and I worked on Endeavor. And uh, that, was, that was something. I worked on Endeavor and Kitty Hawk. That was uh, number 14 and 15. So it was uh, something to know that the things I was working on as you can plainly see, was orbiting the moon, unless you're one of those people who believe we never went to the moon, then of course it's a model sitting in front of a mural. <laughs> but, and this isn't going to help you any, because, well, let me see, let me go one more, there, because I'm building my own. <laughs> so, yeah, so as soon as it's done, then I'm gonna take a picture in front of the moon. What can I say? But anyway, <laughs> I mean, I got it right down to even the instrument panel. I mean, you know, I'm doing the best I can here. So, <laughs> why thank you. Now, what, now this one, between Stony Ridge and, and North American Rockwell, I did a few other things. When I worked at the Hughes Aircraft Company, what we used to call the Huge Air Crash Company, which was... <laughs> <laughs> 
The one fun thing about Hughes was that they had a place in Culver City. And in the Culver City uh, um, um, campus, they had a couple of like uh, Quonset hut type things. And inside was the wooden section of the spruce goose with two nacelles on it that they used as a model to put the spruce goose together. So it was kind of cool to go there and see the stuff they did to build this particular airplane. It was really kind of interesting. And they said at some, some point in time, old Howard used to walk back and forth in that place. We never saw him, but the fact was that he probably was there because the spruce goose was there. Anyway, when I worked for Hughes, I was the president of the astronomy club. And we took a vote and they said, if you had your choice of doing anything you wanted to do for our astronomy club, what would you like to do? And overwhelmingly, they wanted to see the 200-inch telescope. Well, this was in 1974. The 200-inch telescope was like the sanctum sanctorum. You couldn't get in it no matter what. You could look at it through the glass, but you couldn't get in the dome. Well, I was never one to take no for an answer. right? So I went looking around, and I found out through various means that I talked to the manager slash director of the Memberships and Donations Committee. Turns out that Hughes Aircraft gave a lot of money <laughs> to Caltech. And so I made a phone call to Dr. Beverly Oak, and I asked him if we could perhaps get a tour, and the answer was a resounding no. So then I had our Memberships and Donations Committee manager call Caltech. About three or four days later, I got a phone call from Dr. Oak's um, Girl Friday, and they said, what day would you like to see it? <laughs> I said, your call. I'll make sure they can all get there. And so, on some lovely, there it is, there was a January, what is that, January, April the 3rd, 1974. The 20 of us, 20 count them, not two, 20, got inside the dome. Notice, notice, the shutters open. We got to go under the telescope. We got to go through the labs. We got to see the plate room. Um, and then they tipped the whole thing over and opened the mirror cover. So I had to do everything I could because they kept pulling me up on their shoulders and walking me around the inside of the dome. I, said, I mean, I was a god to them at the time. But anyway, and this gentleman right back here is a man that I still remember. His name is Taras Kasinik, and he was our kind of a, a tour guide. And he was a wonderful man. And he actually got us all out in the catwalk and rotated the dome so we could actually see and feel. And it's an amazing thing. Think about, think about the time this, this thing was built and the, the technology they had to build it. And when you're standing on that catwalk, the only way you know you're moving is to watch something near the horizon and it moves. But you can't feel it. You don't know it's moving at all. It's that quiet, that incredibly vibrationless. It was a wonderful time. Now, if you become a friend of the observatory for Palomar, you can, as a friend of the observatory, get in. They have specifically days. Yes? What year was it? I'm sorry? What year was it? Though? About late 40s, early 50s. Actually, late 40s, yeah. It was basically battleship technology. Yeah. So, that is a... so anyway, and I'll show you my little tribute to them in a minute. But anyway, and there's my Apollo. So, that's out of focus. Oh, well. If this were focused, this is one of the things I began to teach people. Oh, God. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, this was taken on film, and it probably looks that way right now because it's out of focus. But the fact is, I used to play with film a lot, and I tried to tell the people who came to my store, even though the digital revolution was beginning to move towards us, you can still use film. And I'll show you another picture that, if it's not out of focus, I can, it will prove that. Ah, now that turned out better. This, <laughs> this, is a, this is my favorite because this is a 20 minute exposure at f 1.5 with a red filter, one shot. It is not seven and a half hours going through 16 different filters to get the same picture. This was done one time, hand guided, 20 minutes, one filter. Go in the dark room, there you are. 
Notice the size of some of these stars with this enlargement. Can you imagine what the, the original, which is an 11 by 14, the stars were measured in microns. It was a wonderful thing. That's what Celestron used to build these things, Schmidt cameras. They're beautiful, they were just because they're perfect cameras. Anyway, that's what I used to teach people when they come to my store. So that was one of the other things I tried to do was move people around. Now, here's the University of Wyoming. I want to try and run this through. This is the Red Buttes Observatory. Um, I was observatory engineer here for a while. We used to play with this telescope, had a 24 inch DFM. This is an old picture of it, still shows the ladder. We put, installed a floor. So we now have a very nice floor and electrical connections that will allow the dome to rotate anywhere. Out. But the telescope is still a 24 inch DFM, wonderful telescope, and I'm build, just got through helping build a spectrograph for it. Here's one of my favorites. This is the 2.3 meter at Wairo, the Wyoming Infrared Observatory. It has its own little cabin where we all used to shower and eat and sleep all day. And uh, it was fun. It was a great time. And then when the shutters opened, here's the telescope, 2.3 meters. It was the largest infrared optimized, teles optimized telescope in the world for a long time, through the 70s. The primary is 2.3 meters, roughly 90 or 91 inches. Yes, sir? Is that the one on the way to the Yes. Well, you can, you can barely see it, but yes, that's the one. Yep. But the, the, the primary is 2.3 meters, roughly 90 inches. The secondary was eight. Very, very small. Because you didn't want anything to wash out the infrared signal. So you had the smallest secondary you could do. It was also F23. Yeah, very long. So when we decided that it'd be fun, I put an eyepiece back here. Oh no, come back here. No, right, there we go. I put an eyepiece right here. It was a 55 millimeter Plossel, Teleview Plossel. Um, we got 1200 power and about six arc minutes of thing. But you ought to see a planetary nebula in 90 inches of aperture at 1200 power. I mean, the Cat's Eye Nebula looked like a, fo a Hubble photograph. It was absolutely incredible. How oh, was the turbulence with all that large? Well, when, you, at, when you're looking at a nebula, you really don't see it that badly. I mean, we didn't look at Jupiter. I think if we had, we probably would have been disappointed. But when you're looking at a nebula, where all you're trying to do is gather as much light as you possibly can, that's when it was really magic. What's the elevation? About almost 10,000 feet, about 9,600. And the windy as hell. And boy, the thunderstorms. You don't want to be up there during a thunderstorm. Anyway, one of the things we did get with Jupiter, because we just happened to bring that up, was NASA used to rent time on this telescope. They came up with their newest infrared camera. And, um, oh, that's the one, but, ah. And we actually got our picture in the APOD, the astronomical picture of the day. Uh, this is Jupiter in the NASA infrared camera. And you can see down here that we had a number of people. We had NASA, we had GSFC, and then Ron and I from good old UW. And uh, this is a deep infrared. This is, the re this is the red spot right here. And then you have the uh, atmospherics. So this, these actually reflect sunlight as opposed to when we see sometimes where they're absorbed this particular, in this particular wavelength, which is around two, two and a half microns. These things reflect the infrared, and so they look very interesting. It's a false color because they're really not blue, but they're just, he did that to show the difference between the various um, reflections. But uh, it was fun to do that, and uh, it, was, it was just a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, spending a lot of time in the dark, eating ramen noodles, and, uh, but it worked out, it was just, it was fun, and I, 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 don't, I don't regret having one hour up there. This was another telescope I spent some time in, Meyer Womble. The wonderful part about Meyer Womble is that it's really high, as you can see, 14,148 feet. And there is a wonderful rock throwing contest going on between them and Mauna Kea. Because if they put a ladder up in one of the telescopes, they might just get slightly higher than Meyer Womble. So it's a matter of who's got the, the tallest observatory. It's a, kind of interesting. But this was Dr. Bob Stencil's uh, observatory. It was fun. Um, they built it very nicely to, to kind of uh, make sure that the wind didn't blow it away, but it did. There was a time uh, during a very high windstorm when about uh, two or three of those panels on the dome were missing when they drove up there. But uh, they have since fixed it. 
Oh, no, I, we have, I, I think I mentioned being a Harley Davidson mechanic. Well, that's my baby. And uh, yeah, she's a, uh, I was going to do this forever, but then I had an accident and things changed. I'm not gonna get into that story, but the situation is I still got her. And then of course, we do, I do a lot of work for the University of Wyoming. This happens to be the summer solstice where I set up a telescope on the roof and everybody gets to look at the sun in white light and in H alpha. And it usually does very well, 50, 50, 60 people sometimes. Once we had almost 100 people there to look at the sun, it was kind of fun. And uh, that's one of the things I like to do. And uh, right here is the filter, Daystar. So you can get the sun in H alpha at about 0.6 angstroms. So it's a, it's a very nice view. Yes, yeah, that was that's the beauty of it. I kind of like that. So now, here's home sweet home. This is my observatory in the backyard. Um, it's a two and a half meter observer dome. Um, and it has my pride and joy in it, which is a six inch refractor, F10. It also has a nice uh, Vixen that I use for um, H alpha right here. And then down here is another little H alpha scope made by Lunt. The beauty of this is that it uses an Etalon. I don't have to heat it, where a Daystar has to be heated. So if you want to just get a quick view to see if there's something very interesting you want to see on the sun, this is a nice, just quick and dirty. Yes, sir? The sun is kind of bright. Yes. Uh, why do you want more aperture, a larger sun? Resolution. Because the, typically your, your uh, um, like a white light filter, to see the sun in white light is really quite magic. And if, there, if the seeing is good, you can, get, you can get down to some incredibly small details in like solar, like sunspots. But if, yeah, but if you want to see prominences in high resolution, then you need more aperture. It's just as simple as that. But above six inches or so, you really don't need to go much further because six inches, depending on the seeing conditions, six inches is going to give you everything you need. But they're very expensive. You get a six inch lunt. Runs about eight grand these days. And there's her from the other side. And you can see the lint on the other. And this is the finder, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's my little viewing place. And uh, my bookcase. And <laughs> my pride and joy. Um, an absolute, guaranteed, no questions asked, George W. Hale autograph. And you just don't find too many of those. George didn't sign too many things and give them away. In this particular instance, he did. Yes, ma'am. Um, did you build that? No, I had somebody build the building. I designed it, and they built it. But I built a telescope mount. I had that built at Hughes Aircraft. No, Ball. I had it built at Ball Aerospace with Jimmy Tucker. Yeah, this, uh, this mounting is uh, kind of a, a put together. Um, you'll notice, if you look real carefully, you can see something raised letters right here. It says Astrola. It was the declination shaft off my first cave telescope, so I wanted to keep that with the telescope. The rest of it, of course, was all built, and uh, the slow motion I built, and the drive I put on. But uh, the dome itself came from Observa Dome, and I put that up. My friend of mine and I put, built that, but the building itself was built by a contractor, to, to my specifications. Okay, there it is. Now, see, film works. Now, I wasn't going to go out and spend $1,200 on a digital camera, but I wanted to get Venus in its transit. So, good old Nikon F and some Kodak film and bada beam, bada boom. Now, they give you a CD, so you can put the CD in your computer and uh, you can still do a pretty good job. And uh, so I've got my record shot. And you know what, it's, yeah, it's not as quite as detailed and all the various other things that digital will do, but it cost me, I think, a whole $15 to have that done between the film and having it processed. Nothing to it. There's a place in California called The Dark Room. They've been in business for 35 years. They do everything. Film, black and white, color, plates, you name it. It's all analog. They'll do it for you. And they'll send you a CD beside. So my little uh, tribute to the Hale 200 telescope is a scale model, which I'm building right now. And I think that's going to come out pretty well. And uh, there it is right there. And uh, the tube, open lattice work. It's going to be kind of fun. You can see down here that there's a set of instructions. So, you, and it's about HO scale. So if you have HO figures, you know, it fits perfectly. You can see it. So you can put a guy leaning against it, you know, kind of stuff like that. It's really pretty cool. Is it going to work? Oh, yeah, it moves. Well, It'll move, yeah, RA and deck. Now, the mirror, my, my, my wife found it. You know, the little plastic mirrors that little girls like to use, you know. Yeah. Well, you pop one of those suckers out and put it in there. Fits perfectly. 
looks really good. <laughs> this is a, a replica I built of Galileo's telescope just for fun. I wanted to see what Galileo saw. So exactly 400 years to the day, my wife and I took this outside and we looked at Jupiter and we saw Jupiter and three moons. And I think we would have seen the fourth, which is Callisto, but it was still light, it wasn't, the twilight was still there. And it's a small aperture, it's only about 40, 35 millimeters. And the, the thing was, it was 13, 17 below zero. And, we, and so we, we weren't going to stay out much longer than that, you can probably imagine. But the interesting part is, and I'm sorry you can't see it quite as nicely, but right, oh, come back here. Um, right here, I wrote in the margin of a pap the paperback copy I have of Sidereus Nuncius. And the fact was that the moons were almost in exactly the same position as they were when Galileo first saw them when he made that drawing right there, which kind of made it kind of fun and unique and interesting. So last shot, this is my Holland with the spectroscope that you're going to be looking through in a few minutes attached to the tailpiece. And uh, I think you'll see that it's, uh, it's kind of fun and you'll begin to see some of the things I showed you with respect to what I saw at the Griffith Observatory. Only this time you're going to see it in real time. Now, Mainta, how would you like to start this? I can get this fired up, but then we should perhaps have people walk yeah, past once so I get it set up. <laughs> yeah, I don't need that. Now this one in particular is neon, and you remember seeing the one from Griffith, very, quite a few red lines in the red, but not too many on the other side. Now, the one thing about this spectroscope that, that I have to explain is that this is a star spectroscope, not a solar spectroscope. That's the solar. Now, not to get into too many details, but the solar spectroscope works in what we call the second order, which gives you a great deal of dispersion, okay? So you can see, to see the entire solar spectra, you have to turn a micrometer to actually rotate the grating so you can see all the various spectra go by, okay? On the star spectroscope, I'm using the first order, so you can see the whole spectrum end to end in one eyepiece, as opposed to having to move the grating. So what you're gonna see in the eyepiece this evening, aha, uh -huh, is the uh, neon spectra in real time, and you'll be able to see how the slit causes the spectra, so you see all the various emission lines of the neon tube that you see there. So again, no smoke and mirrors, you see a bright light, but if you look in the eyepiece, you see what it's made of. So you want to start with the first one? Any time? Yeah, yeah, come on. Just look in the eyepiece. Turn your microphone off. Okay. What do you think? You see all those lines? What do you think about that? 